computer from falling. Um, all right, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, Philippe Johannes uh, and Felix in particular, thank you very much uh, for um, this invitation and apologies for my late running uh, flight. Actually, British Airways was for once pretty much on time. There was just a delay in uh, getting off at Berlin Airport because um, um, there was a delay with the jetty. Uh, but nevertheless, I've managed to make it. I'm grateful to Felix for this invitation. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, Sonia sent this slide, uh, which I really had, I'm not that intelligent, so I had great difficulty in working out how to fill this in, uh, but I've tried my best, and it was much easier to just dis uh, ex uh, show the disclosures to you rather than go through this. And this was even more complex, so I have no idea what these scores mean. Uh, if you wanted to know, well, uh, they're there for you. You can work out what they mean. And if uh, it's still difficult, then perhaps you can ask Felix afterwards uh, what they mean. Um, and talking of intelligence, uh, I was curious to find out about this uh, character. I don't know. When, if you turn Donald Duck's head upside down, what do you get? Well, you get Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> so, That appealed a lot more to my sense of humor and intelligence than uh, all those scoring on the uh, forms. Now, one of the interesting things when I come to this meeting for the last few years, and I don't know if that's the reason why Felix invites me, is um, either every time I get up to speak, somebody falls asleep. And uh, this was uh, one of the guests, uh, uh, when I was giving a talk, I actually took the photograph from my iPhone whilst I was talking, and uh, that's, of course, <laughs> Jochen Weil, who fell asleep, and there was uh, Mark Gvillig, uh, who fell asleep, and there was this gentleman. Uh, I'm sure he comes every year, uh, uh, but, um, and he was actually getting worse uh, as my talk went on. So uh, um, it's um, interesting. I am looking around just in case uh, there are any others for photographs. And of course, uh, our host, uh, who uh, uh, sadly the picture's blurred right in the middle, uh, he was asleep as well on this front row. So uh, um, I'll keep an eye out. Uh, but more importantly, more importantly, I've got this picture of an old friend uh, who's sitting at the back. I've just noticed Lee, and uh, he may or may not have announced it, but he became a grandfather for the first time about three or four days ago. So perhaps give him a big hand uh, for becoming a... <laughs> His daughter tells me they haven't decided on a, na on a name yet. Um, so um, uh, we'll uh, move on to uh, the big right ventricular outflow tracts, and that brings us to uh, venous P valve, uh, which um, is a, a newcomer uh, from China. Uh, it has been manufactured about four or five years ago in uh, uh, Hangzhou and then used in different centers. Uh, it's a self-expanding nitinol multi-level support frame. It's interestingly a tri-leaflet porcine pericardial tissue valve. And the original uh, delivery system was 24 French, and they've managed to get it down to around 19 French. But that is going to depend on the size of the valve that's uh, going to be used. And here are some pictures of a, a flared design uh, on the bottom right, and then a straight design if you need to uh, deal with large outflow tracts that have got stents in, uh, then a straight design is applicable. And then there is a, a variety of disposable crimpers and uh, a, a loading system, a delivery system that has a fairly similar mechanism to all, all of these valves, really. Most importantly, uh, the maximum diameter, and that's the diameter of the straight part, not the flares uh, that is, the venous valve is available uh, at, is 36 millimeters. And so that uh, expands the horizon of uh, some of the larger outflow tracts, the native outflow tracts with transangular patches uh, that we can uh, implant these valves in. And that gets us to around 33, 34 millimeters. And um, if um, your outflow tracks above that, then it's the surgeon's fault and they can deal with that. And there are, I'm sure, like Victor here, surgeons who, who will have to deal with these valves, uh, outflow tracks that are bigger than about 33 millimeters that at the moment we cannot deal with. 
Uh, for venous p-valve, uh, obviously the ideal outflow tract anatomy is like this, where the uh, pulmonary valve, pulmonary artery outflow tract may be dilated, but they have a, a constraint in terms of size. The branch pulmonary arteries should be normal, and that really simplifies the procedure a, a little bit more. Here's a, another outflow tract uh, where venous p-valve could be used. And there are some challenging ones like this, where the main pulmonary artery is quite a good size, but the branch pulmonary arteries have some uh, discrepancy in size. And th this is a patient in whom we did implant a, um, uh, a venous P-valve. You can see the slightly tortuous left pulmonary artery, but there's certainly a dilated, expansile, uh, freely regurgitant uh, pulmonary valve uh, that you can see here. The uh, procedure involves not only measuring the outflow tract, and in this case, you can, uh, I don't know if you can read them, but uh, the pulmonary artery measures around 31 millimeters uh, in, in both planes. Uh, in some uh, places, it measures up to 34 millimeters, and so uh, that's a, quite a challenge uh, for the, uh, any valve, especially venous valve. What we do in these is do a balloon interrogation, and this is a uh, 40 millimeter new med sizing balloon. We inflate that in the outflow tract and then uh, do an angiogram just to make sure that the outflow tract is completely blocked, and then measure the waist as well as the di diameter above the balloon, and then make a selection of the uh, size of the venous P valve. Here is the venous P valve uh, crimped onto the delivery system with a carrot. Uh, sometimes because of the sharp angulation or sh a short distance of the carrot, it can be a challenge to get it through the outflow tract, but eventually it, we manage to get it there. Uh, and then you can see here the uh, venous valve gradually being uncovered uh, in the pulmonary artery uh, and across where the pulmonary valve should be. And once we're happy, we do frequent angiograms, and once we're happy with the position, then the valve is fully deployed and, as you can see here, released. And then uh, right at the end, these are the angiograms, the pulmonary angiogram showing a competent-looking pulmonary valve, um, lateral and aureo projection, and an RV angiogram showing a good position of the proximal part of the flares as well as uh, you can see the uh, venous valve here uh, in very good position. Um, <clears throat> uh, we do carry out, prior to assessment, coronary artery compression because although it should not be a problem uh, in this particular case, um, with a, even balloon sizing, and this was a uh, St. Jude sizing balloon, you can see here when it was fully inflated, the right coronary artery in this case was completely compressed and there was hardly any flow down it. And once the balloon was deflated, uh, then uh, the right coronary artery was normal. The left coronary artery was entirely normal. So we felt that even with um, lower radial force uh, with this uh, valve, uh, such a patient would not be suitable for uh, venous implantation. Now, what about the clinical results? Now, I don't have access to the results uh, in China where the valve was initially used, but it's been used in about 50, between 55 and 60 patients. But outside of China, uh, I've been involved in pretty much all of these cases, uh, 46 of them from September 2013 up to recently. 45 out of the 46 were successful. We used both a flared design as well as the straight design in some patients. One patient, uh, we had to abort the procedure because the covering of the valve cracked because we could not get it around the outflow tract and finished up with a lot of bends and the covering cracked and the valve proximal attachment point uh, sprang out and so we couldn't retrieve it. So that patient had to have surgery. The age range you can see here between 11 and 61 years uh, in that particular uh, bunch of patients. These were all, by the way, compassionate use cases, mean age 23 years. Re weight range 28 to 140 kilograms. Surprisingly, this was not an American patient, 140 kilogram one, it was a UK patient, um, uh, but we uh, managed to deal with him. Uh, there, uh, were 11 centers in six countries and in, in order of uh, frequency, uh, 16 cases in Thailand, 14 in UK, 13 in India, and one each in Indonesia, Greece, and Ireland. Um, and um, the diagnoses were pretty much uh, as we expect. Tetralogy was the biggest component, and then the others, pulmonary atresia, VSD, ROS, uh, operation, transposition, trunk repair. Um, 
of the straight design, there were nine patients in whom pre-stenting had been carried out. Uh, and in these, uh, oops, sorry, we used a, a 30 millimeter diameter in a couple of patients and 22 millimeter diameter uh, straight valve in the others. Uh, remember, majority of these have been in uh, uh, India and Far East where expense is an issue. And uh, uh, so it was cheaper for them to use the venous valve. Um, complications, not surprisingly, with any new experience. Uh, there was one patient who had prior significant right pulmonary artery stenosis, uh, which we decided uh, not to stent it ahead of the venous P valve, and that's uh, for technical reasons, uh, because the carrot then uh, uh, does not pass around or alongside any previous stent. So once we deployed the venous P valve, this is at Evelina in our hospital, uh, it uh, completely occluded the right pulmonary artery, and so we had to pull the valve back and then through the distal flare here, uh, implant a stent in the right pulmonary artery. Uh, in one patient that I mentioned already, the stent could, uh, assembly could not pass through the RV outflow. Now, it, there were two patients in whom the valve migrated somewhat. One was uh, entirely uh, inappropriate size selection and the er error in measurements in the Far East. Um, and uh, one, there was a partial detachment between the valve and the delivery system. And on withdrawing the delivery system, the valve came back uh, a few millimeters and uh, 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 caused dysfunction of the tricuspid valve, which uh, the pulmonary valve was fine. We left alone, and over a period of six months, the tricuspid regurgitation has reduced considerably to mild. So this was the example of uh, uh, right pulmonary artery stenosis in this patient, where you can see a very good position of the uh, venous valve, but there's no flow to the right pulmonary artery. Uh, so we used a bioptome to uh, gradually pull this valve back down into the right ventricular outflow tract. And once we'd got access through the distal flare into the right pulmonary artery, then we implanted a, an LD max in the right pulmonary artery. And that has now achieved a good result of both the uh, venous P valve uh, uh, competence as well as right pulmonary artery stenosis. Uh, and that's been dealt with. Uh, then uh, more recently, very recently, in fact, there was an interesting problem where uh, a 36 millimeter <clears throat> valve, and I don't have the clips yet in the far, from Far East, uh, a 36 millimeter P valve, they had, the engineers had difficulty in crimping it, but managed to crimp it down, and the valve was delivered, and then it was noted that there was this line shadow, which I think you can see there, and when fluoroscopy was done end on, sorry, was done end on, uh, there was infolding of the venous P valve. And so that had to be dealt with by uh, inflating that with the sizing balloon, and eventually a round valve was obtained, uh, and uh, the valve was, had some pulmonary regurgitation in one case, and in the other, no pulmonary regurgitation. So that's a, a problem we've only f seen in the largest valve, uh, and it's probably related to some engineering difficulty in loading uh, at the time of uh, crimping it. And then uh, during follow-up, we carry out fluoroscopy at around three months in all of these patients, and uh, it's not easy to see, but you might just be able to see in that circle and where the cursor is, there's a one single wire crack. Uh, in this patient. And so seven patients uh, have, have uh, single wire fractures. There was one patient who has three fractures, but the valve's functioning fine. There's no stenosis and no regurgitation. Uh, and um, so all of them can have continued to have a good result. Uh, we've done MRI follow-ups at six months and one year, and you can see uh, the mean end, right ventricular end diastolic volume has fallen from 143 down to 110 down to 100 uh, at one year, so that's uh, encouraging. And the right ventricular ejection fraction, a slight increase uh, during the follow-up with MRI, but more importantly, pulmonary regurgitant fraction has gone down from a mean of 43 down to about three to four percent at six months and one year. So again, showing uh, encouraging results um, during follow-up in these patients. And, and then more recently, uh, since last September, we've started a CE study in Europe, um, but, but it's not entirely Europe. It's a non-randomized multicenter study uh, and to assess the safety and performance of the venous P-valve. 
Age range is similar to the initial study, 12 to 70 years, weight of more than 30 kilograms, uh, echo evidence of severe pulmonary regurgitation, or, and uh, MRI evidence of more than 30% pulmonary regurgitant fraction. Um, and um, the MRI criteria are, are the most important ones that uh, we base the selection on. So MRI criteria consists of either reduc uh, reduced right ventricular ejection fraction of less than 45% or pulmonary regurgitant fraction of more than 35, uh, 30% and right ventricular and diastolic volume of uh, more than 150 mils per meter squared. And cardiac catheterization needs to be, uh, with balloon interrogation, needs to be, uh, have been performed beforehand, before the patient undergoes the venous implantation. Uh, so uh, native right ventricular outflow tracts uh, are planned uh, for venous in, uh, valve implant. 40 patients in European Union sites, uh, including UK, we're still in European Union, and 80 patients worldwide. So there are six sites in European Union and 10 sites planned worldwide. Study duration is going to be four years with a one-year enrollment period and three-month follow-up. We're looking at safety, occurrence of death or reoperation at 12 months, and occurrence, occurrence of major adverse events uh, such as myocardial infarction, reoperation, vascular injury, uh, stroke, and pulmonary embolism. Performance, uh, we're looking at successful implantation and hem hemodynamic performance uh, of the valve by echo, uh, and improvement or abolition of pulmonary regurgitation during follow up and structural valve function or deterioration uh, during the first six months. Um, centres that are included uh, in, within Europe, uh, our own centre at Lon Evelyn and London, Leeds, uh, Berlin, Munich, Leuven in B Belgium, and Dublin in Ireland. And then outside Europe, there are four centres planned currently, Sidra Hospital in uh, Doha, Qatar, uh, Children's Hospital in Taipei, Taiwan, uh, Sao Paulo, and Bangkok. So far, 18 patients have been recruited, uh, um, and others, in other centers, logistics are being finalized, but the main patients have been nine from our center, three from Berlin, two from Leuven, and four from Qatar. Their age range is uh, between uh, 19 and 59 years, a weight range of 40 to 100 kilograms, the usual variety of diagnoses. Uh, all patients had severe pulmonary regurgitation, the end diastolic volume of the right ventricle ranging from 130 to 180, ejection fraction 46 to 60, and regurgitant fraction of 35 to 60 uh, percent. The valve was implanted successfully in all the patients. The sizes ra ranged from 28 to 36 millimeters, and the lengths of the venous valve, and that's the uh, straight part, varied between 25 and 30 millimeters. Complications, there, one patient had fever for three hours, uh, and that was related early on to washing of the uh, gl glutaraldehyde preservant. Uh, ventricular ectopics in one patient. Pulmonary hemorrhage in one patient, uh, which was an interesting complication. This uh, involved a perforation by the guide wire during balloon sizing, uh, but we went ahead with venous valve implantation. Uh, he had 24 uh, uh, hemorrhage uh, from that left lung, uh, 24 hours post-procedure, needed drainage, and eventually was discharged home. And then during late follow-up, one patient has developed ventricular tachycardia during bicycling, uh, needed resuscitation, and, and has an ICD implantation. So um, uh, with those, uh, then there, the follow-up is between one month and nine months. Now, all valves functioning well, trivial pulmonary regurgitation in three, systolic velocity across the valve in uh, less than two meters per second. So just to finish off, uh, this venous valve really expands our horizon uh, to deal with these dilated native right ventricular outflow tracts. Uh, uh, some of these patients that have had the straight venous P valve would have been suitable for the Melody or the Sapien valve. Uh, but this is a very early uh, clinical study, uh, short duration so far with follow-up uh, in the CE study, less than one year, uh, and the others less than four years. Uh, so there we were able to deal with outflow tracts of about 32 to 33 millimeters, but what we're looking at carefully is the incidence of fractures, endocarditis, and other complications and valve function in the longer term. Uh, so uh, 18 patients, we await their follow-up and other uh, enrollments in the next uh, few months. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>